Hello, I'm Rachel Silverstein and this is a brief introduction to my book, A Fashionable Century, Textile Artistry and Commerce in the Late Qing, which is being published this summer by the University of Washington Press. A Fashionable Century tells a new story about women as consumers and producers in 19th century China, showing how their engagement with fashion was transformed by the commercialisation of textile handicrafts and the flourishing of urban popular culture. The book begins by establishing the development of dress styles that took place over the Qing dynasty period. Using court imagery, popular prints and workshop painting, chapter one, visualising Qing fashion, ethnicity, place and transmission, reconstructs how fashion changed between the early and late Qing period. It explores how the establishment of the Qing empire by a minority group, the Manchus, redefined ethnicity and place as a mode of difference and hence creative tension within the fashion system, creating new silhouettes and styles that shifted conceptions of fashion away from late Ming values. Fashion was key to asserting ethnic separation. While Manchu women wore long continuous robes like the one on the left, Han Chinese women wore thigh length jackets seen here on the right, worn together with skirts and trousers. But regardless of style and silhouette, all garments were characterised by a plethora of embroidered and woven trimming ornament, ribbons, borders and appliqued motifs. The fashion for the embellished garment has traditionally been understood as one of aesthetic decline. For the dress historian, the trend towards busy designs and crowded surfaces has been seen as emblematic of the overburdened Qing Empire. A fashionable century argues instead that this fashion was ultimately caused by a process of commercialization in the textile and dress industries. These fashions resulted in a large amount of conservative rhetoric from male officials and scholars bewailing the increasing silk consumption by lower status groups like actors, courtesans and servants. Chapter 2, Outlandish Costume and Strange Hats, Moral Discourses of Late Qing Fashion, shows how this discourse was oriented around concepts of fashion, luxury and outrageous dress that were positioned in opposition to Confucian virtues of frugality and simplicity. The gulf between conservative rhetoric and fashion was exacerbated by the new garment trimmings that were central to 19th century fashion change. This chapter asks how far did the tension between the didacticism of gazetteers and family instruction books and the valorization of fashion in urban rhymes and vernacular novels shape the Qing fashion system. Dress objects had begun to be produced in commercial workshops during the 17th century, and by the 19th century, a range of specialised handicraft guilds had emerged. Chapter 3, Boudoir Village Workshop, Producing Embroidered Dress, focuses upon the embroidery industry. This chapter makes use of a wide range of previously unstudied commercial texts, including producer labels, guild dealies, advertisements and pattern books, to chart the steady formation of a commercial dress and handicraft industry under the stimulus of domestic fashionable consumption. By reconstructing the expansion of embroidery industries in Jiangnan around Suzhou and the Pearl River Delta around Guangzhou, this chapter shows how commercialization created networks of urban guilds, commercial workshops and subcontracted female workers. Despite the importance of these shops and workshops, both to fashion and to local economies, they've received little attention from dress historians who have been more interested in imperial design and constructing an idealised view of genteel ladies sewing their own dress. A fashionable century challenges this model, in which gentlewomen quietly and passively embroidered items at home, showing instead how embroidery provided a valid mode of employment for women from a variety of backgrounds as well as a way of expressing contemporary culture. ...and accessories alongside these commercial objects. The book shows how embroidery shops and accessory producers sought to brand and market their wares, and in turn, what these efforts tell us about the conflict of gender values that was inherent to the commercial production of dress and embroidery. The second half of the book shifts from a diachronic to a synchronic approach to explore in greater detail how the orientation towards the commercial producer and the fashionable consumer impacted on 19th century dress objects. 
Connoisseurship accounts of Chinese dress have typically emphasized auspicious motives as preeminent age-old decorative system. But here I argue that two new decorative themes, dramatic scenery and literati values, each underpinned by the normative auspicious motives. Chapter four, performance, print and pattern, popular culture and figural designs, investigates print and performance as a major inspiration for commercial dress producers and shows how new interactions between these producers and other urban craftsmen and women created new content themes. While sumptuary laws and courtly display had once meant that the pictorial possibilities of embroidery had been confined to elite consumption, by the 19th century professional embroiderers were using vivid polychrome palettes and decorative stitches to reinterpret narrative imagery from the most popular plays for far wider audiences. Indeed, even ordinary women could use media like paper cuts to access the most popular scenes, like this climbing over the wall scene from the story of the Western Chamber. But artisans and home embroiderers were also enabled by a vast pattern repertoire offered by woodblock printing. And in particular, the book shows how pattern books like this one, entitled Gu Embroidery Patterns from Old Suzhou, allowed for the spread of fashionable motives and urban design. Seeing viewer familiarity combined with producer competition resulted in ever more novel and abstracted means of representing dress, culture on dress. And this chapter demonstrates the highly sophisticated and referential ways in which dramatic narrative was rendered in late Qing material culture, and thus the intertextuality of 19th century dress, the desire to reference and to shape popular culture. The increasing presence of dramatic scenes points to the importance of the clothed body as a site for negotiating cultured identities, and to the importance of embroidery and allowing women to express this cultural influence. The final chapter, The Luxury of Words, Fashion, Authorities and Aspirations, uses close study of a group of objects containing poetry, inscriptions and other components of literati culture to explore literariness as a fashion trend. Fashionable wearers desire to put forward an educated self, reflecting the aspirational role of literacy and words in Chinese society. Such ideals circulated visually in popular prints, which depicted scenes of beautiful gentlewomen in their boudoir, accompanied by signifiers of wealth, culture and literacy. The ideal was also asserted in fashion. This jacket is made from a yellow and blue chrysanthemum patterned cloud brocade silk, a speciality of the Nanjing silk industry. But the white satin trimmings on the collar, bottom and side borders are all embroidered with calligraphic inscriptions of poetic lines, interspersed with landscape motifs, each one taken from a different poem, many of which are well-known Song Dynasty verses. Notably, these embroidered inscriptions are used not just as a vehicle for literary expression, but also to record the moment when the jacket was created, so we're told where, where the piece was created, who wrote it, and when it was written. Yet reading the changing forms of clothing description in 19th century novels alongside ribbon sample books and printed patterns reveals not so much the educated gentlewoman and the literati, but rather merchants and courtesans as cultural authorities. In this chapter, I position these poetry adorned garments and accessories alongside other textually linked aspects of Qing fashion, in particular the use of auspicious names for trimming as commercial techniques that utilise the cultural accessibility of literati culture to create market worth. Like so much of Qing fashion, they too were produced at the intersection of commerce and culture. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy reading the book.